pointing us to the light of the world. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, Father, we have been reminded through that beautiful song, Lord, of the light that came into this world, your only begotten Son, that he would bring light into our hearts, that we might become his light to shine forth the truth of the gospel and the reality of Jesus Christ. Father, now I pray that you might open our eyes, illumine us, Lord, to the truths of thy word. We ask in Jesus' name, amen, amen. If you'll take your Bibles, turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to start there, but then we're going to move, okay? We're going to start there. We're beginning a series, I'm beginning a series, a three-part series that will take us through Christmas, Okay, and today is the first part, and I titled this series Christmas Fruit, Christmas Fruit. I, I don't know how many of you give uh, baskets of fruit for Christmas, but I know it's a popular thing. Maybe you've rece- you receive, you know, fruit baskets, and oh, that's, and you look forward to that. It's a great gift. So if you're, uh, you can't, now the hard part is re-gifting. If you, if you do that. But uh, anyway, the fruit baskets are great. You know, I think of all that, that beautiful fruit. You know, when it comes to Christmas too, when we speak of fruit, there's another thing that comes to mind, and that is fruitcake. Fruitcake. Oh, every time I think of it, it makes me gag. Uh, ever since I was a kid, ever since, you know, it would be, uh, mom and dad would buy some, put it on the, there, and we, we had to eat some, and, and I couldn't get it down to this day. And uh, if, if I ever got a, a gift of fruitcake, Todd and Laurie, wherever you are, um, they had given me one one year because they knew of this as a practical joke. They got me, but... but the fruit cakes, if you, don't, if you don't want to eat it, they make great door stops. They just put it at the door and keep it open. But you, when I'm thinking of fruit, I don't want that kind of fruit. But, but fruit, we're going to look at the fruit of Christmas, the fruit that God gave man, gave us. And as we enter this Christmas season, the gift of fruit When I'm thinking of the gift of fruit that we give physically, I'm thinking of spiritual fruit that has been offered to us through the gift of God's own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, once we uh, accepted Christ as our Savior and we heard that gospel message and we trusted through faith in Him, we were born again. And at the moment, as you know, at the moment we are saved and converted... It is at that time, very moment, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us and our bodies become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's an awesome thought. And that's how Jesus lives inside us through his Holy Spirit, which he promised he would send after he left this earth, he told his disciples. And so we have received the Holy Spirit into our life. But I think it's important that we understand what that means. What does it mean that I have the Holy Spirit living, living within me? He has come to give me power and strength and to produce something Christ-like in my life on a daily basis. And that's where we come to the fruit. And so I'm, I've chosen three different kinds of spiritual fruit we're going to look at over the next few weeks together. And of course, as we turn to Galatians 5, you're probably already thinking of it, and it's crossed your mind of where we're going here. But Galatians 5, and we'll pick it up at verse 22. Look what Paul says to the church in Galatia. Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, and we all know these, you could all recite it by heart, I know, many of you. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. 
Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus, verse 24, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, here's the key, he says, let us also walk by the Spirit. What does it mean to... now? If we live by the Spirit, what does it mean? What's the difference between living by the Spirit and walking by the Spirit? Living by the Spirit means that when, when I was saved, I had the Holy Spirit enter my life, and now I am living my life by the Holy Spirit. He indwells me, and He will never leave me nor forsake me. He's been seal, he has sealed me unto the day of redemption, so I know I'm going to heaven. I have that seal. But the question is, now that I have the Holy Spirit, how do I walk my life? How do I behave? How do I honor the Lord as a, as a Christian, as a believer in Jesus Christ, as a follower of Christ? And that is what he's talking about here, walking by the Spirit. And this means to be control, under the control of the Spirit in my life. And that's where this fruit, this fruit of the Spirit that we just read, becomes evident in our lives. And the fruit comes where? From God. From God's Holy Spirit. It comes from God himself. These are characteristics of God's nature, his attributes, the, and the attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're going to only pick three of these fruits of the Spirit to look at in the next three weeks. And uh, let's look at the first one. So if you'll turn with me now to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, our scripture reading today. <clears throat> and uh, we covered this when we studied the book of 1 John. But pick it up with me at 1 John 4, verse 7. And this, of course, as you read it, will tell you what the first fruit we are going to be looking at this morning. What spiritual fruit? Verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. John continues. By this, the love of God was manifested in us. The love of God manifested in us the moment we were saved. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live, what? Through him. There's living by the spirit. That we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God but that he loved us first. And he sent his son to be the propitiation, or that word means the satisfaction to God, for our sins. Verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to, what? Love one another. No one has beheld God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. In, as we view the Christmas season and the Christmas story, the first fruit of the Spirit we want to look at is, of course, here, love. The love of God. How that affects me and how I respond to that love as a believer once I am saved. There again in verse 9, by the love of God, by this, the love of God was manifest in us. So when we're saved, the love of God has come into our hearts and is manifest there. That God has sent his only son into the world that through him we might live. And so we understand that God had to send his love first. We knew nothing about this kind of love. And we know what the, the term used for God's love is in the New Testament. It's that word agape. 
which is that self-sacrificing, uh, complete commitment uh, of love to, to someone without, uh, without any reservations or, or expecting anything in return. And this is the way God loved us. And of course, that takes us to John 3.16, of course, where the, the whole gospel is wrapped up in one verse. But was it, what does it start with? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. But, you know, as I think of God's love and as I was studying this, uh, it began to hit me that how many times have I really failed to grasp the depth of his love? How many times have I just kind of thought, yeah, God loves me. That's wonderful. And I just live out my life. But I really don't get to look and understand the depths of his love for me. What kind of love sent his son Jesus to the cross? And we have an illustration, a story in the Old Testament that gives us an example of the depth of God's love this morning. So if we want to see that. And if you'll turn with me now to an Old Testament book, the book of Hosea. Would you turn with me to Hosea? Now you're thinking, what in the world? How does Hosea fit into Christmas? But let's turn to Hosea. If you're wondering where it is, it's right after the book of Daniel. So if you find the book of Daniel, Hosea is the next book. Okay, so that may be helpful. But we come to Hosea here. <clears throat> now, Hosea, in his lifetime here, God is using him to prophesy mostly to the northern kingdom of Israel. Okay, so he's a prophet mostly to the northern king of Israel, kingdom of Israel, which was under the reign of King Jeroboam. And he was an evil king. Now, at this time, uh, you recall that the, the, uh, the uh, tribes were separated, you know, they had divided Judah in the south and the other 10, uh, 11 tribes in the north. So you had, had the northern tribes and the southern tribes. Northern tribes were called Israel. Judah was called uh, the tribe of Judah. But here we have a, a prophet named Hosea who has been prophesying that God is going to judge Israel. Now, at this time in history, under Jeroboam, the northern kingdom was prospering, much like America. I mean, they were affluent. The money was coming in. Everything was good. They were prosperous and wealthy, and yet they were poor spiritually because they had turned away from the God of Abraham. They have turned away and began to worship other gods. And that's when God said, I've given you time. I'm waiting for you to come back to me, but judgment will be coming. But now we come to the beginning of the book here. And we look at the first verse together. Let's just read verse 1 of chapter 1. The word of the Lord which came to Hosea, the son of Barry, during the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. And there's that northern kingdom we were talking about. So here we have a picture of the kingdom. He is prophesying to the northern kingdom especially. They were prospering nationally and economically, but spiritually they were a disaster. And so now 
God does something incredibly strange. And as you look at this, this is uh, one of those controversial passages that people have debated over the centuries, okay? And uh, about whether or not what we are going to read, literally, God, God told uh, Hosea to literally do this, okay? And it's quite stunning. But this whole thing is given to us as a picture of the depth of God's love and how far God will go to love his people and to love you and to love me. So let's look together here at verses 2 through 4. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of harlotry, and have children of harlotry. For the land commits flagrant harlotry, forsaking the Lord. And so he went, and he took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Name him Jezreel, for yet a little while, and I will punish the house of Jehu for the bloodshed of Jezreel. And I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. Now here he's speaking of the northern kingdom, not Judah, through which the Messiah would come. In verse 5, And it will come about on that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. But verse 2, take a good look at verse 2. It, are we actually reading this correctly? God says to Hosea, and this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to this prostitute and who's living a life of sin, a Jewish lady who's living a life of sin, and I want you to go get her and marry her. And then she is going to give you children. We read of one of the children that God named. And the rest of the children, God told Hosea what the names of the children were going to be. Because those, the names of those children represented the judgment and the forsaking of the children of Israel. That they forsook God. And now God is reminding Israel through Hosea and his family as an example of what Israel is doing to God. They are being unfaithful to their, the God of their fathers, and they have turned to idols. And so now the Lord God wants to set up a picture for, for Hosea to understand so that Hosea will actually experience the hurt and the pain that God experiences when his children turn their back on him and go away from him, as many times you and I do. Now, there are the controversial part of this is that how could God ask a man to do such a thing, to go and find a prostitute and marry her? Specific one, Gomer. Well, there are three main views to Gomer and this, this account. One is the parable view. There are those scholars, Bible scholars, that believe that this is more written like a parable, that God wouldn't actually tell the prophet to go marry a prostitute. So Gomer wasn't real. And, it, and that this is just a parable to, to give an illustration, give us an illustration. Um, great Bible teachers like John Calvin held this view. Okay. Well, sadly, I disagree with John Calvin on this. I take it the, the, one of these other views. He took it as a parable. The, third, the second view is a promiscuous view, that Gomer wasn't really a prostitute, but just a promiscuous woman who uh, needed a husband to just settle her down. And so Gomer married her. Because nobody could still imagine that God would... Ask him to marry a literal prostitute. 
But then the third view is the prostitute view. And this is the idea of taking this, this scripture and this story literally. That this is literally what God has done. And as I look at this, this account, I don't see any, any signs that would make this allegorical or, or, or a metaphor, like a parable, or just not real. It's written like any other part of the Old Testament of, a, of an account. When God talks, he speaks. That, that he, it, it's, it's, it says what it says right there. And so I personally take this as literal. Now, however you choose to take it, it doesn't, it, it's not crucial as to, you know, uh, whether or not, you, you know, you still grasp this story because it is the spiritual truth behind all this that we want to grasp this morning as we, as we consider the spiritual fruit of love. Spiritual fruit of love. So what does he do? Well, he goes and he obeys God. And then uh, as you go on then, you can read the rest of chapter 1 where he, Gomer uh, gives birth to more children that God gives names to. But we must remember that God here is trying to get a message across to Hosea to understand that what you are going to experience, Hosea, is what I'm experiencing with the nation. The nation is like Gomer. And they have, they, they have lived in sin. I came and I took them in. I made them my very own. And so Gomer shows grace and mercy and takes her off the streets and she becomes his wife. But now we come to the second part of the story and that takes us over to chapter 3. If you'll turn to chapter 3 with me, Hosea 3, and we'll look at the first five, well actually it's the whole chapter but it's only five verses. Let's read it together. And all these other chapters are concerning God's judgment on Israel that's coming, but also God's restoration that he is going to bring to Israel or to, and to Judah. But here something happens to, in Hosea's life and Gomer. Then the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by her husband Yet an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the sons of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love. What does it say there? I have raisin cakes. I guess you could put fruit cake in there if you wanted to. But they, they, they went after the things that, uh, that, that were uh, opposite to God. They, they went after uh, idolatry. And we must remember that. At this time in Israel, when they were involved in idolatry, it was to Baal, the god Baal, Canaanite god. And, and, and when you worship the Canaanite god, sexual immorality was a big part of that worship. And so some scholars believe that Gomer could have been worshiping Baal and been part of that whole culture of, of sexual immorality uh, surrounding that idolatry. But what, is, what does he say here? He, he, this woman, now it doesn't mention her name here as Gomer, but it is Gomer. Okay. In other words, Gomer left him. He got her, took her off the streets, married her. And she had children with him. And then she says, uh, I'm going back to my old lifestyle. I'll see you later. Abandonment. Left her husband high and dry. Left Hosea home with the kids. And now he's a single dad. What's he going to do? You know, many times it's, okay, that's what you want. Okay, go ahead. I'm done with you. 
you know, you, you just abandoned me. I don't want any more part of you. But look at God's response to this. God knew that Gomer was going to leave him. And God was going to bring good out of it. And going to give us an example of the depth of his love, God's love. Look at verse 2. So I bought her. Okay, remember, God said to him, the beginning of verse 1, Go again and love this woman, even though she's an adulteress. Go get her. Verse 2, So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and half of barley. So totally, if you include the produce, it comes to about 30 pieces of silver. And that's exactly what it cost to buy a slave back then, 30 pieces of silver. Somehow it seems that she was taken into slavery, uh, either in the, by, the, by the people, uh, the, the uh, priests of, of Baal or, or those uh, who were in control of the prostitute situation. But she became a slave when she left him. And ended up in a bad place. And God said, I want you to go get her. And I want you to bring her back. And I want you to pay a good sum for her. Buy her back. In verse 3. Then I said to her. This is Hosea speaking to Gomer. You shall stay with me for many days. You shall not play the harlot. Nor shall you have a man. So I will also be toward you. For I will also be toward, uh, toward you. For the sons of Israel, now God speaks of the sons of Israel. The sons of Israel will remain for many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, or without ephod or household idols. Afterward, the sons of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they shall come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the last days. Here God is telling Hosea, one day what you have just experienced is what I'm going to do with the nation I love. The people I love. That I'm going to go get them. And I'm going to bring salvation to them. And I'm going to bring them back into the land. And I'm going to bless them. And they are going to turn from their wicked ways and idolatry. And they will come to me in the last days. And we know that is the case. After Israel will be judged. They are still, they are still, uh, have, uh, are not worshiping the God of the Bible. But here is the picture. The Lord is showing us through Hosea. He's saying, Hosea. I want you to do something that you don't feel like doing. You may even despise your wife by now. But I want you to go back and get her and bring her back to yourself. You're going to redeem her. And that is a picture, the depth of God's love. That God chases after us when we as his children many times slip off and turn away from the Lord and we get involved in, the, in things that different kinds of idols. But how many times has something in this life, material or otherwise, or money, become an idol to me? And so that it's taken my focus and my love away from the Lord. And I basically, like Israel, have turned my back on the Lord. And I've just gone after the things of this world, the things that, that, that I want that please me. And just like we act just like Gomer, and we say, I want to go back to this. I need this in my life. And God is just set off in the background. And, and just like Israel, we sin against God. And maybe right now in our lives, that is uh, something that, that as you look inward, and I look into my heart, do I see an idol there? Where I, it, that has taken my affections away from the Lord. I must understand this. That 
if I would understand the depths of God's love, that no matter how far I get away from God, I'm his child, just like the children of Israel belong to him. I am the ch a child of the king, and he will forgive me and receive me back. He's chasing me down as, as Hosea did Gomer and saying, I want you back. I want, to, I want to cleanse you. I want to forgive you. And I want to restore you. See, this is all about restoration. And God desires to restore each one of us when we go astray and when, when we've fallen. And not only that, but you know what he wants us to do? He wants us to take the love that he shows us and has given us. And by the fruit, Holy Spirit, produce, he produces the fruit of the Spirit to love us. Others who have hurt us deeply, who have harmed us, who maybe have stabbed us in the back, maybe those who have betrayed us. But God is looking for us to have the love of Hosea that he had for Gomer and be willing to say, yes, I want you back. I will forgive. And that is the sign of redemption. And we see the beautiful picture of the redemption. He went and bought her back. And so the Lord Jesus bought you and me out of our sin, slavery of sin, with the purchase, with the, the great value of his precious blood. The blood that washes all my sins away. I pray that we will see this morning this, this love, the depths of God's love this Christmas. And that he wants us to run back to him. He never stops loving us. Plastic surgeon Maxwell Maltz tells the story of a man who'd been severely injured while attempting to rescue his parents from a fire. His heroic efforts proved to be in vain, though. His mom and dad died in the burning house. True story. During his rescue attempt, the fire had scorched his face and disfigured it. He was so ashamed of his appearance after, after he looked in the mirror that he refused to allow anyone, including his wife, to see his face. He didn't want to have anything to do with her. For help, she went to Dr. Maltz. And the doctor said to her, not to worry, he assured her. I can restore his face. But despite the good news, the wife still felt disheartened. Her husband had always refused medical treatment. And assuming he wouldn't change his mind, and he didn't want to see her no matter what, she said this to the doctor. Dr. Maltz, I want you to disfigure my face so I can be like him. If I can share in his pain, then maybe he will let me back into his life. Well, Maltz tried to mask the horror at this request. Of course, he refused to perform this operation. But he was so moved by the woman's love for her husband that he went to visit the man. Through the closed door, the man wouldn't open. Doctor yelled, I'm a plastic surgeon, and I want you to know that I can restore your face. There was no reply. Please, won't you come out and at least let me see your face and let me talk to you. There was silence. And still speaking through the door, Maltz told the man what his wife wanted to do. Maltz yelled through the door, your wife wants me to mutilate her face in order to make her face like yours. She hopes that you will then let her back into your life. That's how much she loves you. Then ever so slowly, the doorknob turned and the door opened and the disfigured man came out and threw his arms into the doctor's arms. The doctor took him to his wife. 
And when he saw his wife, he wept and threw himself into her arms. And they were reunited, and he was willing to, he understood now what the depth of her love was. Dear friends, Jesus was disfigured for you and me. I'm here because of his disfigurement. He says, I'm willing to go in your place. I'm going to become like you. I'm a sinner. He's a holy God, the son of God who knew no sin. And yet, what did he choose to do? What did God choose to do? In order for me to be like him, he had to become like me. He had to take on my sin. And when he did, my disfigurement was gone. He, he made me into the image of himself, the image of Jesus. My friends, this is the image that God wants us to portray to the world and to each other. We can only do that if we understand the depth of his love. We confess our sin, turn from our idols, and say, Lord, cleanse me. And Lord, help me to love you the way I should love you, just as you love me, and to love others that same way. And God will bless and honor your life and restore you into the image of Christ. Let's pray together. As we bow our hearts before the Lord, dear Christian, this morning, as you reflect upon the love of God, that fruit of the Spirit that he gave to you the moment you were saved, but you didn't realize maybe how deep that love was, would you now take inventory of your own life? Look into your heart. And look for the, anything that might be an idol. And turn from it. Knowing that God is chasing you down. Looking for you to come back to him. He has open arms and he will restore you and forgive you no matter what it is. But would you do it now? Just lay that idol at the altar of the cross. Say, Lord, forgive me for this sin. Lord, I turn my affections back to you, my first love. Thank you for showing your love on Calvary for me. If you're here without Christ this morning, I invite you to accept the Savior and know his forgiveness and know this new life that he can give you that will be given if you would just trust him and confess your sin to him. Come to him as a sinner. Just pray a simple prayer like this now. If you want to accept Christ as your Savior and you want to be born again spiritually, and you want to know God's love and receive everlasting life. Pray with me now. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I am so sorry for my sin. I believe you died on that cross for me. You took the punishment for my sin. Come into my heart right now and wash my sins away. I receive you today as my very own Savior. Thank you for dying for me and rising from the dead, Lord Jesus. And with head still bowed, if you gave your heart to Christ, you have now become a new creation. Jesus has entered your life through his Holy Spirit, and he has cleansed you, forgiven you, and now you are robed in his righteousness, and you're part of God's family forever and ever. Heaven is your home. Welcome to the family of God. Father in heaven. Thank you for decisions that have been made. Thank you for the picture of your redemptive love that we've seen in Hosea. And Father, may we love that same way. And may we be careful to not allow idols into our life that would steal our affection away from you. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.